Chancellor, uh, Acting Vice-Chancellor, ladies and gentlemen, and the people behind the pillar, um, <laughs> thank you very much for that warm welcome. I should um, hose down a couple of the uh, uh, expectations that might have been generated by those rather over-generous remarks. Uh, it was said that I did science and law, which is absolutely correct. Uh, in the, but I should point out that in the third year of my science degree, um, which was in physics, uh, uh, along with the other students, uh, I had to do a presentation, a seminar presentation on a topic, and I chose a very cutting edge topic. It was uh, mathematical group theory and elementary particles. And the, uh, the uh, head of the physics department said at the end of my presentation, you express yourself magnificently, but I'm not sure you know what you're talking about, <laughs> which uh, was a suitable qualification and encouragement to enrol in law. <laughs> Uh, which I might say I enrolled in not having any necessary, uh, not having in mind that I would necessarily become a legal practitioner. It just seemed to me that law would offer me the widest range of choices. And it was only when I started actually doing articles of clerkship, which was a two year apprenticeship process that doesn't exist anymore, uh, that engaging with clients with real legal problems uh, and looking for solutions to those problems that uh, my motivation uh, was truly engaged. and. Uh, a motivation which has never diminished. Uh, it's an honour to have been um, invited to this uh, celebration of the 25th anniversary of the founding of the uh, law school at the University of New England. This is my second visit to UNE. In 2011, I came here to deliver a lecture in honour of um, Sir Frank Kitto, a former Chancellor of this university and a former Justice of the High Court um, of um, Australia. I remember at that time I had a little bit of pre-lecture hospitality from the then uh, head of the school, uh, Jürgen Bromer, and, uh, and uh, we had lunch at a cafe in town, I think, with, uh, with Harry Geddes, and uh, uh, I was uh, in Harry's camp putting the case for a standalone statutory interpretation uh, unit. <laughs> I might say that uh, Harry, of course, along with um, uh, uh, Dennis Pearce, is uh, co-author of uh, Australia's leading uh, text on statutory interpretation, which was my pleasure to launch and to write a forward for a couple of years ago. Uh, this time around, the uh, uh, pre-talk uh, hospitality has been no less. Uh, I have been uh, given a magnificent tour of the, uh, uh, all the sites of, um, of uh, uh, Armadale by Paul and uh, Deborah Arcond and uh, Paul Sattler, who was very keen to point out his house. <laughs> which uh, is opposite the uh, Teachers College and which he tells me will be painted shortly. <laughs> and we uh, stopped off at uh, Julie Warren's place and uh, inspected her vegetable garden. She somehow got the idea that I was a vegetable gardener. I had made some quip about the fact that at a country uh, a holiday house we have down at Denmark on the south coast of Western Australia, I have vegetable gardens. I had not made clear to her that I run these vegetable gardens by telephone. That is, I ring up this guy in, in uh, Denmark and say, would you plant lettuces, please? <laughs> so that, uh, but I must say I was hugely impressed by uh, those and by her freshly, cake, freshly cooked um, orange cake and, uh, and uh, tea. Uh, then we went and visited the, uh, the art gallery uh, and uh, the teachers' college. The art gallery was a real eye-opener. I had not been aware of that Hinton collection before and it was... Uh, it was really wonderful of sort of seeing that range of uh, leading Australian uh, Australian artists. So uh, I've been um, well uh, well wined and dined. We ended up literally wining and dining at uh, Peterson's uh, Winery uh, uh, under the under the trees. So it's been a very pleasant uh, morning. Now it's sometimes helpful in a dinner speech. And I suppose I've got to sing for myself now uh, to frame its theme with a quotation. Uh, rather like the way in which sermons for any of those who still go to church begin with a passage from the Bible. Um, now, apposite generic quotations on anniversaries are difficult to come by. Most of them relate to, um, to marriage and they reflect either existential despair or a rather cloying sentimentality. But uh, Mark Twain once wrote of anniversaries in a way that has wider application when he said, what ought to be done to the man who invented the celebrating of anniversaries? Mere killing would be too light. <laughs> Anniversaries, he said, are very well up to a certain point. They are joy flags that make gay the road and prove progress, and one looks down the fluttering rank with pride. Then, he says, you begin to notice the flags turning into milestones, marking something lost, not gained. And at that time, it's best not to take any notice of them. Well, that time has not been reached at this law school, and I 
uh, can, can predict with reasonable confidence that it will not be. Why do law schools and universities uh, celebrate significant anniversaries? Uh, one answer is that for those who have taught and studied here, the bank of memories derived from their experiences is part of their personal identity. And the key memories become more important parts of identity from year to year. And coming together reinforces them when alumni and teachers greet and talk to each other and in so doing recover part of their own past. There's another reason, of course, for celebration and support in relation to law schools. Law schools are part of the great national enterprise of higher education. They produce far more graduates than there are places in the profession. I think 12,000 of whom 6,000 uh, annually are likely to get into um, uh, the, uh, the profession itself. Um, but those graduates, whether they go into the profession or not, are equipped by their education to understand something of the fundamental infrastructure of our society, which we call the legal system. Importantly also, those who have the benefit of a legal education have the opportunity to understand the weaknesses and limitations of our system along with its strengths. As people who are aware of the law's weaknesses as well as its strengths, law graduates will be conscious also of the inequality of access to justice. And in this context, that inequality which is experienced by many, including rural, regional and remote Australians. Access to justice challenges for some of those people were highlighted in the Justice Project report published by the Law Council of Australia earlier this year, and I chaired the steering committee uh, which oversaw the production of that report. And that report expressly recognised the need for the expansion of rural, regional and remote focused curricula in undergraduate law training. And it recognised the need also for government to acknowledge and act on its responsibilities to ensure effective access to justice where there is market failure in rural, regional and remote areas. This law school has in the last 25 years taken the leading role in the provision of legal education to the region it serves and has demonstrated the importance of that legal education in regional areas generally. Its history, of course, takes its, part in the, uh, takes its place in the larger history of the university, an important part of which is the history of this building uh, in which we're gathered tonight. We know the campaign uh, for a, a university for northern New South Wales began in the early 1920s. It was promoted by Armidale's civic leaders. A backdrop was the incipient New State Movement. The campaign got a great boost when the local state member, David Henry Drummond, became Minister for Education uh, in New South Wales. Years of on-again, off-again efforts followed, during which regional leaders had protracted dealings with the state government and with Sydney University. The acquisition of this building from the White family was central to the project, and ultimately it all came together in 1937, when the house was acquired and the New England University College was established as a college of Sydney University. I might say as a Chancellor, it's an interesting reflection on university governance that the Vice-Chancellor of Sydney University at the time, Robert Wallace, who was a great supporter of the establishment of this uh, institution, managed for two years while supporting the project to keep it away from the Senate of the university. <laughs> and so when it was finally presented, it was a fait accompli and they had, to, they had to sign off to it. The University College became the university in 1954, offering courses in sciences and humanities with a focus on rural science and rural economics. This university was the first Australian university to be established outside the capital city and was from its inception a leading provider of distance education, and today, and this law school of course is part of that, is an innovator in flexible online education services. And in that respect, it is close to the wavefront of digital change which confronts all of our universities, whose future may include the transmission, as part of their curricula, of highly interactive online courses presented by the highest qualified teachers and researchers from leading universities around the world. Distance education, is becoming a global phenomenon and our universities have to know how to engage with it and exploit it as both givers and receivers while providing the essential learning experience of students and teachers interacting in real time face to face on real campuses. And uh, I can't, maybe it's a, a reflection of my own experiences as a student of the 60s but I cannot underestimate the significance 
of the social and physical interaction on a real campus, uh, no matter how many of the lectures are captured for online uh, transmission later on. Uh, in the early 1990s, of course, UNE was offering some law units as part of its accounting and business degrees. Law schools were starting to spring up around the nation. UNE decided to set up its own, and it was not without opposition. One concerned citizen wrote to the university saying, it seems to me there's already an abundance of law faculties in Australia and an abundant supply of lawyers. Though lawyers are essential to the functioning of complex society, they are essentially non-productive and a cost to society. <laughs> Well, despite that disquiet, the law school came into existence in 1993, offering both distance and on-campus teaching, and it now claims to be Australia's largest and most experienced distance provider of legal education. Its research, as uh, Amanda mentioned earlier, was rated as world standard, according to the last ERA assessment in 2015. Importantly, the law school is not just about the production of more lawyers. As its website says, our degrees have provided a platform for our graduates to succeed in a wide variety of post-degree careers, including legal practice, government, non-government organisations, business and academia. The Law School services its region, hosting, among other things, the Centre for Agriculture and Law, which has been mentioned under the directorship of Paul Martin. It has attracted industry and government funding, and it publishes the Law School's journal, the International Journal of Rural Law and Policy. Interestingly, it also has um, a focus on legal history, which is an important and not to be underestimated uh, uh, factor in a deeper understanding of the law. And it's pleasing to see that Professor Mark Lunny was awarded an Australian Research Council Discovery Grant to research the history of Australian tort law. He's actually been in that field for a long time, and I'm sorry he was unable to make it here tonight. I understood that he had a, a, a prior uh, commitment uh, which was a holiday somewhere which has already been paid for, so I perfectly understand. <laughs> but I remember as Chief Justice uh, addressing the Medico Legal Society of Victoria in 2009, and I chose as my topic a topic which Sir Owen Dixon had addressed them on back in 1933, uh, the science and judicial proceedings. Now, at the time he gave that talk, Sir Owen Dixon had only a month before delivered a judgment about faulty underwear causing dermatitis leading to depression in a case called Grant and the Australian Knitting Mills. This was about an Adelaide paediatrician who bought a couple of pairs of long johns uh, from a store in Adelaide and worn them for a whole week without changing, which apparently, according to the trial judge, was quite routine for uh, the citizens of Adelaide at that time. And he got this horrible whole body rash and uh, all sorts of... Anyway, um, there was a hugely long case, a trial, and then it went to the High Court and it went to the Privy Council. Uh, it was Dixon's first major exposure to the challenge of scientific proof of cause and effect. And in preparing my address, one of the most helpful sources I found was a paper by Mark Lunny about Dixon's approach. The paper was called Causation, Science and Sir Owen Dixon and it was published in the Australian Journal of Legal History in 2005. Um, Dixon's approach, by the way, had been fairly rigorous and contrasted with what some might call the less rigorous common sense approach of the dissenting judge, Evatt, whose thesis was no dermatitis, long johns, dermatitis, ergo. <laughs> <laughs> which is called the common sense approach and which actually was vindicated to some extent in a case called March and Stramari, which also happened in Adelaide. They do some crazy things in Adelaide. So there was a, uh, a drunken driver uh, ploughed into the back of a truck published on a median, uh, parked on a median strip in the middle of the night in a poorly lighted area and uh, the, uh, the truck driver was found liable on a common sense basis. The law school's focus has not been confined to regional and historic issues. It has a wide range of offerings and reaches beyond the region. It offers its students opportunities to study overseas or by participation in overseas uh, uh, experience units. It hosts international students and sees its own graduates spread far and wide. And I notice that there have been particular collaborations with schools of law in Brazil um, in the area of environmental law and governance, land distribution and small-scale farming. And in February, the centre hosted a seminar with the director of the Research Centre of Agricultural Law at the Agricultural Management Institute in the Ministry of Agriculture of the People's Republic of China. The story of the law school over the past 25 years is a remarkable one. It is, of course, a story about people, and particularly about the people who helped to build its reputation and who loom large in its collective memory. Those who have passed on include Dr Peter Hemphill, 
who initially thought a law school apparently was a bad idea but changed his mind and became one of its great advocates. Uh, Foundation Professor Iris Magna, who came to UNE in 1996 and took over a number of academic leadership roles, is another. And Fran Wright, another who moved here as a lecturer in criminal law in 2011, is also fondly remembered, and I'm very grateful to Julie Wearing for passing those names on to me. Now, I didn't know any of them, but they were among many personalities who've made UNE law what it is today. One person I did meet, because he appeared in the High Court representing himself when I was Chief Justice, was Brian Pape. Uh, his was a quixotic mission uh, to challenge the power of the Commonwealth Executive to expend money without valid statutory authority. As most, if not all of you will know, uh, the Commonwealth enacted a, a tax bonus act and it was going to send cheques for between $200 and $900 to all Australian taxpayers so they all go out and buy flat screen televisions and help offset the worst effects of the global financial crisis by a process known as fiscal stimulus. Um, anyway, he said the Commonwealth did not have the constitutional power to expend money in that way. The Commonwealth said it did, it said it got it from the Constitution and it said it got it because there was a parliamentary appropriation. The court found that the constitutional executive power actually authorised the expenditure in the particular circumstances of a national response to a global economic challenge. So on that question and on that basis, Brian lost the case. He did, however, win a very important point, that the mere fact of an appropriation act was a necessary but not sufficient condition to authorise expenditure. You had to find the power to expend this money uh, under a statute or somehow under the Constitution. And that conclusion was an important element of the Court's examination of executive spending power when it held invalid Commonwealth funding for the school chaplaincy program in Queensland in two cases brought by Mr, Mr Williams. It's ironic that Brian Pape would have been one of the recipients of the payment he was challenging as I was to say to him when I met him much later in Perth, he tried to bite the hand that tried to feed him. <laughs> he exemplified in his inimitable way the engaging and infectious enthusiasm for the law that makes for great teaching. I had a friend like him at UWA who died a couple of years ago. We did some test cases together in the public law field and he was engaged as an academic counsel in others. Uh, I think John Tarrant might know him, uh, Peter Johnson his name was, and he used to tell his students and no doubt Brian Pape could have said the same thing. We don't just teach constitutional law here, we make it. Uh, that was emphatically true of Brian Pape. It's sad that he passed away too early. I'm delighted to see that a prize was established by the law school in his name. He's part of a long history. The law school has much to be proud of in that history and much to look forward to. And to borrow from Mark Train's remarks again, the flags are still fluttering and they warrant your celebration. Thank you.